All right. Ah, our attendance keeps going lower and lower. At this rate, there will only be one of you by the last class. Actually, my, uh, my last two lectures, which were after the last homework was due, um, only had two people in them last semester. So, uh, and David's section, I think, had seven people. Uh, I'm not saying you guys shouldn't come to the last lectures. You should all come to every lecture. But uh, yeah, it definitely uh, slows down near the end here. All right, so we've been talking about um, regression. Uh, regression is just fitting, uh, you know, generating predictions that are floats, uh, numeric predictions, uh, given some input. Um, we talked about uh, linear regression, which uh, models everything as a linear system. Uh, it can't do curves. Uh, so in this example, um, you know, we don't do a very good job of the curve. Um, we then moved on to looking at, uh, uh, well, we, moved, we looked at the formulas for linear regression and whatnot. But um, we then looked at uh, transformations of the data that you can do uh, ways to augment either the y, uh, per, uh, sorry, target value or the x uh, feature vector so that you can get some nonlinearities. Uh, we, um, then we started looking at uh, ways that we can identify outliers. Um, also, we did um, a little bit on identifying whether the regression was good or not. Uh, so one comment I have, uh, we talked about r squared the other day, and I kind of mangled the math. Um, that happens when my notes are wrong, and I try to do it on the fly. Uh, but I want to get this right. So hopefully I have the math here. Um, so we talked about how uh, the variance of the target values, oh, good, good idea. Uh, okay, uh, we talked about how the variance of the target values is equal to the variance of the prediction. And this is where I think I messed up. Uh, I was thinking variance of the noise, but this is the variance of the error. Um, all of those things are, are, you were able to calculate them. They're not, they're not uh, random variables. Uh, we know what y is. That was our training part of our training data. We know what x is. That's part of our training data. Beta is the thing that we learned, but it's a fixed something. Um, and e is just basically y minus xb, uh, which is actually how we come up with this, because uh, y, xb, um, you know, basically is a combination of uh, y minus xb. So the whole point of this is this is something that you can calculate. And then when we talked about the R squared, um, this is the variance of the XB over the variance of the Y. And what that is, is it is how much the predictions explain the target values. So I think we have a picture here. Um, that's not a great one. He may not have a good one. No, why doesn't he have a picture of that? OK. Um, we'll look at this one. It's not a great example. Uh, because it was actually an example of a, uh, a bad regression. But what we're seeing here is uh, we, did, we did some sort of regression, and then we plotted sort of the, uh, the uh, residuals. And really what we're looking at is how much of the variance uh, in these y values uh, is explained by the, you know, the variance in this particular, uh, these particular values. Um, the more of that, the more variance that you're explaining, 
the less, the, the lower the residuals are going to be and the better the prediction is going to be. So if we had a R, R squared value of 1, then we've explained all of the variance. Uh, there is zero residual left. Uh, and then if there's zero residual, you've basically aced the, aced the, uh, the regression. Now, this is on the test set probably, not on the training set. Um, but you could calculate the same thing, or sorry, this is typically on the training set, uh, the way we wrote it here, but you can calculate it on the test set uh, so you get a better estimate. Um, but this is kind of the idea. You can never explain more than all of the variance, uh, obviously, and that's why R squared tops out at 1. And if R squared is 0, that means you have basically haven't learned anything. It's just you've learned some random. I don't actually think that you could get down to a 0. You'd have to be pretty bad. Uh, so anyways, that's what the R squared was. Uh, just to clarify in case, and I'm sure there was a lot of confusion there. Um, and then we started looking at uh, ways that we can uh, identify outliers, basically, bad points. And so we talked about uh, the hat matrix. Someday I'm going to build a system that switches for me. It would probably save me a lot of time. Um, so we have a hat matrix. Uh, the hat matrix is this sort of crazy, where do I got this? Um, it is x times x transpose, x inverse, x transpose. And the reason we, we like this is that we can say that the predictions, which we'll say are x hat, which is equal to x beta hat, um, is equal to the hat matrix times the original y inputs. And when you do a regression, if you have a, a, a prediction y, which only relies on the original input, that means we haven't really learned anything. We just memorized it. For that data point, we've basically memorized that this prediction is equal to this input, the original input. And so if you're, uh, there's numerous uh, things that we talked about that limit the, you know, the size of things. But basically, if your diagonal value is equal to 1, then you've uh, literally just memorized it. You have just, you're saying that for this input, I'm going to take the input y value, and I'm going to output that as the prediction. And that's a bad thing. That means that either, I mean, it basically means that is some way that that is a generic case that you don't, wanna, you don't want that to happen. Um, so the higher the, uh, this, uh, the diagonal is on uh, any of the uh, points, the worse your prediction probably is on those points. So you really don't want to have a hat value where the diagonal is high. And now again, high is very arbitrary. Um, you kind of have to look at a graph and to kind of view how these things uh, fall compared to other points to identify these things. Uh, anything over 0.5 is right out. I mean, that's just, you've really done too much. Uh, things less than 0.5, then it becomes a little, uh, a little more questionable. Um, this particular value is referred to as the leverage or leverage, depending on how you want to say it. Um, so that's the leverage. So that's our first tool for identifying outliers. Um, our next tool was the Cook distance. Uh, the Cook's distance is a measure of uh, if you were to leave a data point out and redo your regression, how much does, do things change? So as we saw, um, there is, let's see if I can find this graph. I need to get this, print the book with no text. Uh, 
This is a, a synthetic data set, but classic problem with outliers. So this, the one on the right here is the regression where we leave this outlier in. Um, so we have some th synthetic data that is basically a line. We added a bad point to demonstrate what an outlier does. And we can see that the regression is really bad. Um, if we were to drop this point, the Cook distance basically says we drop this point. Here is the new regression. How good is it? So we've dropped a point. We get a very good uh, regression compared to the other way. Um, so that, that's what we refer to as the Cook distance. We write the Cook distance um, as y hat, uh, which is our predicted value, minus y hat, which is our predicted values, which when you don't have that particular, uh, the ith data point in, uh, you transpose that, uh, and you do y, y hat without the ith data point, and then you have a normalizing factor, uh, which is just the dimension and the mean square error. Um, and this basically, uh, this is for every data point. I even thought when I switched over to here that I got to remember to switch back. But all right, anyways, uh, I wrote that down yesterday, so you guys don't need to see it again. Um, the, uh, so this is the Cook distance, the formula for the Cook distance uh, for a given data point i. And again, if this is high, um, if the change in the prediction is high, then that's a bad thing. Uh, you don't want predictions to suddenly, uh, suddenly move just because you take one data point out. That, that's a bad sign. It's a sign that you're, uh, you're not doing a very good job at, uh, or it's a sign that that one data point is, has an undue influence uh, and on the regression. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is the third major, uh, uh, let's start a new one. Well, I'm on the right spot. This is the standardized residual. So residuals are just the errors that we make. Uh, the errors are scaled arbitrarily according to the unit of the, of the y value. So the standardized residual um, is just the, the residual that is, it has been rescaled, so it basically follows a normal pattern. Um, and then we can sort of look at it and say how much of the data should have been within, say, the first uh, standard deviation, the second standard deviation, and whatnot. So uh, we can deduce this by looking at the, uh, if you remember, we had the x transpose beta plus some sigma. Uh, it doesn't look like a sigma, but. Um, and this was a normal. Uh, that's just the noise. Uh, it has zero mean. Uh, so we can compute the, res uh, the variance of the ith data point. Sorry, the ith residual. And that is going to be equal to this. Uh, it actually uses the hat value, the hat value along the diagonal. Um, now, given that, uh, that standardized residual, or sorry, the variance of that, uh, that uh, particular data point, uh, we can calculate the standardized residual. So this is just the error of, uh, of a given data point divided by this uh, standardized residual. Um, sorry, it's the square root of that. So it's divided by E transpose E over N. That's actually, I think, a typo. Um, this is not for the ith. No, it has to be for the ith. Yeah. Hmm. Weird. Okay. Um, 
So that's a standardized residual. There is an extra set of parentheses. Uh, that's a standardized residual. So we take basically the variance. Um, we take basically the variance of uh, the error times the hat value, one minus the hat value. That gets a basically a scaling factor for each of the uh, data points for the residuals. We then take the individual residual, uh, E of I, we divide it by that scaling factor, and now everything is uh, basically falls out as a normal, or it should fall out as a normal. Um, because it should follow out, fall out as the same, uh, uh, as sort of the pattern of the noise. Um, now what we know from a normal is that, uh, and you guys should probably know this, but 66% of the data should fall between uh, negative one and one standardized deviation, uh, standard deviations. Uh, and then 95% should fall between 2 and 2, and 99% should fall between 3 and 3. Um, so if you have a data point that isn't falling uh, within that, this range, um, so let's say you have 100 data points, you should only really have one that falls outside of negative three and three, you know, statistically speaking. Um, if you have uh, a lot of them, if you have something that is, say, uh, has a negative five or a five for a standardized residual, uh, then you have a data point that is very, very unlikely. So unless you have, you know, a million data points, you shouldn't see one really out at a five standardized residual. The chances are very low that it, it'll be out there. Uh, so let's look now. So we got three things. We got the leverage, we got the Cook's distance, and we have the standardized residual. Now we can look at a given, uh, uh, a given problem and an example where we actually look at these, how these things interact, and we can identify outliers with them. So let me look at the, which figure this is, 11.9. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at, uh, this is a, um, basically a regression. Uh, this is the, uh, let's see, it's the weight against height uh, regression for, I think, people, not fish, um, since you don't talk about the height of a fish. Um, and this is actually where we, uh, we removed four outliers already. And so what we'd expect, just based on a, uh, the noise model, is that the residuals of this, uh, of this set of data should follow a normal. And so what you get is this sort of uh, pretty nice normal. Um, it's a little lopsided. Maybe it's a little questionable that there's some sort of bias in here that we wouldn't expect. Uh, but uh, the nice thing is that the, the noise doesn't seem to really be correlated to the fitted value um, or the predicted value. Uh, that's a good thing. If the fitted value and the noise, some, or sorry, the residuals, um, the standardized residuals have some sort of pattern in them that's uh, correlated to the, the fitted value, that's generally a bad thing. Um, the noise should be independent of the value that you predict. Um, and the standardized residuals should follow a normal. So this is kind of normal. Not great, but uh, could be worse. All right, let's see. Um, I thought there was more, I thought there was one more set of graphs that we wanted to look at. I'm in chaos for notes lately. Um, okay, uh, there is actually one more set of graphs that I apparently didn't put into my notes. Um, all right, so this is, these are really small, let's see if we can make them a little bigger. Um, okay, so... In R, there is a really nice utility uh, called GLMNet. Um, it's a regression package that calculates things like the standardized residual, the 
Cook's distance, and the leverage. And it allows you to look for outliers. Um, and it's, it's nice because you can just run it. In fact, I think we have you run it uh, for homework six to actually do this. Uh, but you just run it, and it will give you basically a graph that will show you how all the data points fall out. So this is a pretty simple, we're just, uh, we just did a weight versus height uh, regression. Um, and then we plotted this, this nice graph that uh, GLMNet uh, spit out. And what you have down along the bottom is the leverage. Along the sides is the standardized residuals. And then you have sort of these level curves of the Cook's distance. Um, if you looked at the Cook's distance, the, the, uh, you, can, you can correlate these things to each other just because you can look at the formulas. So uh, a leverage standardized residual can, forms kind of a, a, a certain value for the Cook's distance. So you can draw these level curves where you know, anything along this uh, line is going to have a Cook's distance of 1. Anything along this line will have a Cook distance of 0.5. Uh, same thing down here, 0.5 and 1. Uh, so let's look at the outliers in this particular thing. So we have 0.39 up there in the corner. Uh, the leverage isn't bad, meaning that it is actually calculated from a lot of different input Ys. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, the standardized residual, though, is up at uh, above 6. So that's uh, a sign that there's really a problem with this. It is way outside what our noise model should have uh, predicted it to be. Uh, the chances that this is a, a real point that isn't somehow degenerate, wrong, a poor, uh, either just a poor sampling, a very unlucky point, is really small. Uh, the uh, 42 is also pretty, uh, pretty suspect. It, uh, it's got not only a fairly large standardized residual, which is bad, but it also has a really high leverage, which means that it's only using a portion, a small amount of the, sorry, let's, let's say that a different way. It's using a lot of the input Y to predict the output Y which isn't what we want. Uh, we don't want it to be memorizing these Ys. We want something that generalizes by using a combination of all the Ys. Uh, so if we throw out um, those, I think we threw out those two points. Yeah, we threw out those two points we just talked about. And this is going to be the procedure that you use to identify outliers most of the time. You'll, you'll go in, you'll take out the really egregious ones, You'll then iterate, you'll uh, do the regression again, and you'll look for more. Uh, and then it becomes a judgment value of how many outliers you're going to take out. You can't just keep taking out outliers forever. You'll have nothing left. Um, you don't want to take out ones that are kind of questionable, like they might be outliers, they're not outliers. But it becomes very much a judgment. It's, it's something that uh, you can't teach. You just have to do a bunch of regressions see what works. In the end, it depends on your application a lot. Uh, this is part of the art of machine learning, not, the, uh, not sort of the science. OK, so we, we did the regression again. We, uh, we fitted it, uh, or did this uh, plot again. Uh, what we see is, first of all, we have maybe one more or two more outliers that, uh, you know, this one maybe is an outlier, uh, the 216. Um, it's out at the three standard deviations, which means that it should only happen, you know, one in a hundred uh, data points should be out at that point. Now, we might have a hundred data points, in which case one of them, actually statistically speaking, should be somewhere around three. Um, four, though, I don't know the, uh, the exact number of the probability of something being out at four, but it's pretty low. So this one that's sitting out at four, is almost certainly an outlier. Now, if we look at the leverage, uh, notice these are very, on very different scales. This was, you know, point, uh, 0.5 for the leverage, uh, whereas this one is 0.03. So even though these points are kind of, you know, far out from the other ones leverage-wise, uh, they probably aren't really bad. 
uh, the leverage probably isn't saying that these are bad points. Those are very small leverage numbers. Uh, you'd expect them to be smaller than that maybe, but, uh, but it's not necessarily bad. Um, now let's see, I think the bottom right, okay, so I think we, uh, we took out these two points, 41 and 216, and then we did the same thing again. Um, so now you see uh, standardized residuals. There's nothing that's really an outlier from the standardized residual uh, perspective. Um, the leverage hasn't changed really. Uh, nothing's really uh, outside on the Cook distance. So you probably got rid of all of the data points that are fairly questionable. Um, I'm not sure really that I would say that these two that are labeled 36 and 145 are questionable. Maybe they're a little bit on the outside. Uh, that's a place where you'd make a judgment. Um, there's a lot of judgments here that we can't give you hard rules for. Uh, now, these are really good diagnostic plots. Uh, and these are great ways to identify outliers. The problem with this whole procedure is it only works on small data sets. Uh, and that's, that's a big problem because people don't, I mean, people do use small data sets nowadays. But often, when we talk about a data set, we're not talking about hundreds of points. We're talking about millions of points. Um, and you can't run a, a procedure like this on millions of points. There's just a, you have to do the regression a million times because you're dropping points. You have to, you know, you do these very expensive uh, things. Uh, you have to calculate uh, an inverse for that matters to get the hat matrix, uh, which is extremely expensive on a, on a large uh, number of points. So this, you got to take all of this uh, diagnostics with a grain of salt. Outliers are hard to identify. These give you tools, but often you're not able to use the tools because your data sets are too big. Um, all right, so uh, all right, so that's all we have on sort of identifying outliers and sort of the procedure to get rid of them. Uh, now we're going to look a little bit at uh, some issues that you can have with regression. Ah, remember to switch. Okay, so if we looked at uh, if we go back to the formula that we have for linear regression. At some point, we had this. Um, that particular formula. And you'll notice that uh, this is sort of your covariance matrix, uh, very similar. And when we talk about covariance matrices, uh, one of the things that was useful about a covariance matrix was that when you take the, the eigenvalue decomposition, there was a lot of eigenvalues that were small. Again, this goes back to the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of data has correlations in it. So it's essentially a much smaller, lower dimensional data set just sort of hiding in a, in a bigger dimensional space. And uh, the problem with small eigenvectors is that it takes, when you have small eigenvectors, it basically takes big values and maps them into small values. Uh, and consequently, um, when we take the inverse of this, so if we just move this around, we end up like that. If we have small, eigenvalues here, that means that this inverse will have large eigenvalues. Uh, so that means it's going to take small numbers and uh, basically make them big numbers. And the problem is, the problem with that is we're taking some number here, we're taking it times this inverse to get our beta. And what that means is that small changes in the data, the input data, is, uh, will lead to large changes in beta. So uh, we take a slight 
slightly different data set. Uh, we take it times this, uh, this inverse that has large uh, eigenvalues, and beta changes a lot. So there's a lot of instability here, where you, know, you take a slightly different sample of data, and beta is totally different. Uh, and that's definitely not what you want. You want beta to be very stable. You want to be able to do the regression on different data sets, different samples of the same distribution uh, for your training data, and have things come back, you know, mostly similar. Um, so this is a pretty big issue. Uh, so the fix is instead of minimizing what we minimized before, uh, in order to get these equations uh, was the squared error. So we can look at the squared error here. Um, that's what we started with to minimize. Now, uh, just like we talked about in uh, classification, we can add a term here uh, we can add a term which is a regularizing term. It's an L2 uh, regularizing term, um, and it's basically just the beta transpose beta, so it's the square of beta summed, uh, scaled by some lambda, and divided by 2 so that we get uh, nice math that comes out. Uh, and remember, when we, when we uh, in order to minimize this, we take the derivative, we set it equal to 0. Uh, that ends up... Uh, getting an equation just like this with a small change. Um, so uh, basically that regularizer uh, gets pushed in to this term. Now what does this mean? It means that the eigenvalues of this, of this whole thing can never be less than lambda. Uh, because you've added a lambda across the diagonal, uh, you're, you prop up all those eigenvalues, so you make sure that you never have this case where you have really small eigenvalues. So you add this, uh, this level of stability uh, by making the eigenvalues higher. Uh, so this basically makes sure that changes in your data are not going to change beta uh, in any extreme way. Um, it also has a tendency to minimize beta, you know, push it down to a smaller, uh, a smaller number. But, um, but that's kind of the, the intent, is don't let beta change a lot as you get a different set of data. Um, now, you have a hyperparameter. Uh, just like any hyperparameter we have, um, you need to you need to choose that. And uh, anybody want to guess how we choose a hyperparameter? Come on, you should all know this by now. Uh, you cross validate. You try a bunch of things. You see how it does on a validation set, um, and whatever the best uh, you know the best lambda is on your validation set, you use. Uh, okay. Uh, so, is there any questions on that? This is regularization. Yeah, this is regularization, just like, uh, just like we did it for classification. We had the same technique. Yeah, this is the regularizer. Oh, uh, well, this is, this is how, this is, okay, so this is the error for linear regression. So we're talking about linear regression and fixing it so that it's basically stable as the data set changes. Um, if you change the data set, beta should be fairly stable. You don't want it jumping all around. Um, so it's really regularization on linear regression. Uh, does that clarify it? OK, cool. All right. Um, yeah, so far, we've been talking pretty much only linear regression. Uh, now, regularization applies to nonlinear regression. Uh, the math isn't, uh, there's, I mean, there's other forms of regression uh, that will also have regularization. Uh, some of it is conceptual. You do regularization. The term might be different. Uh, but almost always you add some sort of regularization to, uh, to sort of constrain the problem and make sure that it's well-behaved.
Okay, so uh, let me go back to here. Uh, so the so we looked at uh, here we did it's another GLM uh, uh, nice graph that it kicks out. So the first thing we did is the whole point of the next two slides is that regularization does not fix outliers. Uh, these are two separate topics. Uh, you want to have regularization. You also want to get rid of outliers. Uh, regularization is still, even with regularization, uh, regression will break if you have outliers. Uh, so we have sort of an example here of, first of all, we look at, we've already taken the uh, four outliers out. This is the same regression that we looked at just a second ago. And basically, uh, GLMnet, we told it to try a bunch of lambdas. So we did some cross-validation, and what you get is there's some mean squared error, and you can see how it changes as you increase lambda. And so you can look for some, you know, sort of a sweet spot of the, uh, of the lambda. So in this case, pretty much uh, what GLMnet is recommending is anything between, I don't know, maybe that's uh, log 1 to log 3 of lambda. Um, I would guess that's negative, but usually lambdas are pretty small. But, um, but anything in there, uh, GLMnet is saying, you know, basically, uh, you, you know, it's not making a difference. Uh, it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's reducing the error, uh, but it's not really, you know, it doesn't matter which value of lambda you choose. Now, again, the, uh, this is a standard deviation of the cross-validated. So what it did is it went through all the lambdas. It did a cross-validation to get sort of a standard deviation. Um, and uh, then it plotted it so you know what happens when you adjust lambdas. And you can actually see on the right-hand side here, uh, regularization versus non-regularization uh, doesn't really make a big difference on this particular data set. Um, now, if we come down here, the whole point that uh, regularization does not fix outliers. Here we did the same thing, but we used all of the outliers along with all the, the good points. And what you see here is even with regularization, uh, you still have issues. First of all, the mean squared error, uh, if you notice the mean squared error up here uh, was, you know, maybe around 500 was the good case. Um, and down here, the best you're going to get is up around 8 to 900. So already your mean squared error using regularization is much higher when you have those outliers. And now this, this side, you can actually see that uh, regularization is making a big change in the, uh, in the prediction, but it's not making necessarily a better uh, prediction. Um, I mean, certainly it, it is... Uh, if you're down here, you have no regularization. If you're here, you have some regularization. So it's improving it some, but it's still very bad. Uh, so the whole point of this is outliers and regularization are different things. You have to remove outliers and then do regularization or do them both. So sort of our, our formula we're going to have um, is... When we do regression, first thing we're going to do is we're going to look for outliers. And we're going to get every time. In, uh, when David teaches the course, he prints out all the graphs, but then he zooms in too far, and then he can't see anything because he's zoomed in, so he has the same problem. doesn't matter which way you do it. Uh, nothing works here. Okay, so outliers are the first thing you're going to do. And you're going to use, uh, if you can, you'll use those GLM plots. Um, now, those GLM plots are only in R. Uh, Python doesn't have nearly the sort of statistical uh, roots that uh, R does. And so these statistical techniques, 
uh, that work re uh, really well on small data sets don't always have the same sort of uh, corresponding uh, functions on the Python side. And that's actually an indicator that the people who wrote the Python sort of learning stuff didn't feel that these graphs were very useful, uh, mostly because they don't scale well. However, if you can do it, you'll identify your outliers. Uh, it is an important, uh, important thing to do. Um, once you identify your outliers, you're going to look at your standardized residuals uh, versus fitted values. Uh, and again, predicted values, fitted values, same thing. Um, we sort of arbitrarily use them. Uh, so, okay, so here's two uh, graphs. The first one is with the, uh, it's the standardized residuals. Uh, again, we can compute those just by normalizing the residual uh, versus the fitted values. Uh, and the first thing you should see on this guy is that our outliers are definitely kind of weird. Um, there, I don't know if that or that one is the outlier, but they fall in odd spots. Uh, that's actually a good sign that these are, uh, these are bad things. Uh, calculating standardized residuals is actually easier than calculating, say, the Cook's distance and whatnot, um, or cook, uh, calculating the hat matrix. So, uh, so, well, you still need the hat matrix to do the standardized residuals, so maybe it's not any better. Uh, but what this is showing is that you can actually spot when you, when you graph the fitted value versus the standardized residual, uh, what you want to see is that it's just noise, that there's no correlation between the fitted value and the standardized residual, because the noise should be separate from the value. Um, and that's, you know, this is still, there's some oddity, it seems like, like if this is not really a normal across all the fitted values. Now, if we get rid of those outliers, uh, we actually see something really bad. Um, we've got rid of the outliers. Now our, uh, we have this sort of banana pattern. Um, I don't know if that's a technical term, but uh, it kind of looks like a banana. And the... This should not happen. This is definitely not a normal, uh, uh, a normal sort of uh, layout of the points. So, what was that? I haven't written anything yet. You, you didn't know I was going to write anything. Um, I could have just been going over my notes. Uh, so this generally. Um, is going to indicate if you need to do some sort of nonlinearity transformation. So if you have a non-normal uh, layout of the points, um, if there's some sort of shape that isn't just a nice cloud of these uh, on, on this fitted value versus standardized residuals, you have to do something to get rid of that. So that means one of two things. You do some sort of transformation on the Y, or you add some terms uh, to, the, uh, to the feature vector. Um, or you do transformations of both. Uh, there's a bunch of things that you can do. Um, you just have to sort of play with it until you find something that has, uh, you know, that doesn't have this sort of weird uh, behavior. Um, so I think... We have, this is the worst day for this. Um, so I believe we did a box Cox transformation with 0.5. So we transformed the Y value. Um, and we see this is the, uh, for some reason there was six outliers removed this time. But this is what the outliers removed. We have this very suspect pattern over here. Um, if we do that transformation of the Y, now we get a pretty nice uh, cloud of, uh, of data points. So the fitted values are here. I don't know why those fitted values are so different. Um, but you have this nice uh, 
cloud where there isn't really any correlation between the standardized residuals and the uh, predictions. And that's exactly what you want. You want sort of this nice uh, bit of a cloud. Now there's still something possibly odd about the fact that this is sort of lopsided, that you get some, uh, a bunch of points down here and no points up there. It should be uh, symmetrical across the, uh, the zero line, um, uh, the zero y-axis. So it should be symmetrical along here. Um, it's not, uh, there's probably some nonlinearity still stuck in there somewhere uh, that wasn't fixed by our transformation. Uh, it, depending on your use case, it may or may not help uh, to keep working on fixing this. Um, so once you've kind of done these two things, now you choose your lambda to do regularization. So the order of doing these things, it's, it's actually kind of a problem. Like, do you do your regularization choice before you identify your outliers? Well, that, that doesn't quite make sense. Um, choosing your regularization before you've done the, linear, the nonlinear transformation, that doesn't quite make sense, except that they both probably will be helped by having the right regularizer. So it's a little bit, you know, the order you do these things in is a little bit up in the air. You could tr choose a, uh, a lambda for each of these steps. You could choose a lambda for your outlier detection. You could choose a lambda for your, st uh, your uh, nonlinearity kind of detection. Um, that gets really costly, though. So generally, you do the first two, and then you choose your lambda. Um, and then the, the fourth thing you generally do is we want to do a scatter plot of true versus predicted. And you generally want to do this on the test set. Um, so I think we got a picture of that of what it should look like. So uh, we got a, uh, the true values are along the, the bottom here, and the predicted values are along the top here. Now I think he, um, it doesn't actually say whether this is the, I, I would guess this is the training, done on the training set. Generally you'd want to do it on the, a, a test set or a validation set. Uh, because the, when you do it on the training set, assuming you removed the nonlinearities, uh, the training uh, has tried to make this a diagonal. Uh, you know, that's the whole point, is that it's tried to make the predicted values equal to the true values. So definitely on the training uh, set, you should have a nice uh, diagonal line here. Um, on the test set, that's where you're really going to see if there's something kind of weird where you overfit or did something odd, where often this will be a nice straight line on the test, and then it'll either be, uh, you know, there'll be some non-diagonal slant or some odd curve into it uh, on the test set. So training set will often look like this. Test set uh, often looks worse. Um, but that's kind of the, uh, the steps that we use when we're doing uh, linear regression. Um, or regression in general, actually. Uh, that doesn't necessarily apply just to linear regression. Uh, is there any questions about that? Because we're going to go into a new topic here um, that is somewhat more difficult. Yeah. Um, no, you did. You didn't. Uh, there isn't a good solution. Is the problem? Uh, it. You can look for points that ha have high uh, mean squared error compared to the other ones. Um, that'll sometimes give it to you. Uh, it's expensive to calculate that standardized residual, so that's. Uh, and without the standardized residual, it's kind of hard to say that a high mean squared error is a bad thing. Um, 
Definitely a high mean squared error is going to tell you that it's a lot farther out than other things. But those might not actually be the problem points then. Because if you, if you remember the, uh, the graph where we had an outlier and it shifted, um, it actually had a, let me see if I can find that again. Uh, this guy. Oh, wow, that was lucky. All right. Um, okay, so we added an outlier here, um, and it shifted this whole, this whole line down. Now, the mean squared error on this point is actually pretty high, um, so maybe that would help to identify it. Um, sorry, this is, it's not even the mean squared error. It's a squared error because you're not taking the mean over the points. Um, but if, you, if it shifted it enough, it might be that the squared error of this guy was the same as the squared error of this guy uh, if that line just shifted a little bit more. So it's not actually saying that, you know, this point, if it's squared error gets too high, is any worse than or is an outlier because maybe this guy is the, is the culprit, but maybe this guy gets a squared error that's about the same. So it, it's really hard. Uh, is what it comes down to. With enough data, you would hope that there's fewer outliers, but maybe that's not true. It depends on your data set. It depends on the process that created the data. Um, maybe you just have some sort of, there's something statistical out in the world that there are outliers in this data set. Maybe you had a sampling error, you know, when you took the data, there was mistakes. Uh, it's really hard to identify these. Uh, a lot of times you just don't. Um, in the end. I mean, we, uh, when we were doing it, we never tried to identify them. I mean, but we were talking about, you know, when I was working on these things, I was talking about at least millions of data points. And you're not going to be able to say, you know, first of all, you can't even, you may never get the regression even done in the first place. Like, the regression may never get stable because you're taking in new data all the time and you're doing stuff like that. So even finding these things or calculating the regression multiple times is difficult. Um, it's really tough, is what it comes down to. Well, that's that's exactly what the Cook's distance is. Um, that's exactly what we're calculating: is that we're dropping those points and seeing how things change. The problem is that doing that requires a regression for every point you drop. And so it's really expensive. Like I said, you, you know, with big data sets, you may not be able to calculate a regression efficiently uh, just once, let alone a million times. You know, uh, with a million data points, you can probably do the regression fairly quickly. With a billion data points, uh, which is not that, that crazy nowadays, um, you definitely can't do the regression over and over. Um, and you definitely, it, you have to do the regression over and over for each additional data point, you know. So it really gets out of hand really quickly. Uh, anything else? Okay, cool. Uh, 20 minutes or so. All right, let's see. Okay, so the next topic is... Um, the, the, this is actually going to the next chapter. Uh, the chapter is uh, about choosing models, how you choose models, uh, which is the right model to choose. I think that's a little bit of a, uh, an odd way to describe this chapter, um, but it's definitely related. Um, so when we do a regression, we're really, uh, we're going to say that we're choosing a model. And what that means is two things. First of all, we're choosing a family that we're going to work within, a family of models. So say we're going to work with linear regression and we're going to work with just the, um, the uh, we're not going to do any kind of transformations. We're not going to add any additional terms to the feature vector. That is a family of models that are parameterized then by beta. Uh, now we could have another family of models where we add things to the feature vector such as the, the squares, the quadratic terms. So you'd have not just x, but you'd have x squared. 
Um, that's a whole other family of models because we have some additional parameters uh, and it's going to be able to fit different things. So there's a question of what families should we use. So as we saw, um, I think I am going to take this and try to get the, uh, just the graphs out. Not there. I think I spent about half the class scrolling, which I know is entertaining for you guys. Oh, come on. This is a graph you've seen, just to prep you. It's about fish. Uh, it's the fish weight versus length. Um, I'm going to find it. There we go. All right, fish uh, length versus weight. So when I talk about model families, this is, uh, we're actually looking at three different model families here, the linear, the quadratic, and the cubic. And that means that we took, uh, the first one we only took x, the next one we took x and x squared, the third one we took x, x squared, and x cubed. Um, this is another model family. Uh, where we took uh, all the way up to the power of 10. So x, x squared, x cubed, blah, 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 up to the x to the 10th. Um, those are all considered uh, separate model families. Now, when we do our regression, uh, we try to pick the, a set of parameters that is the best set of parameters for a given model family. Um, but we also need to choose what model family to use. So we could just do our regression and say, uh, a priori, we're going to always do the linear or always do the cube. Um, we could do that. that. That's an OK thing to do. But in general, you, you'll probably say, oh, this did quite work. Let me try a different model family. Let, let me try adding those squares, uh, see if it works better. As, as soon as we start doing that, we have to have some sort of criteria to choose things. Something to say, this model family is better than this model family. Uh, so this chapter is sort of about that. How do we choose uh, which model family to use? Um, now, the reason we need to be able to do this is the, if you look at this, uh, this one where it's to the 10th power, if you looked at the mean squared error of this, uh, it actually is way lower than the mean squared error of this guy, any of these over here. And that's because we've, we've given it a lot more degrees of freedom. It can move that line around a lot more. Um, if we gave it a high enough power, we could hit every single data point um, and have a mean squared error of zero. So you can't just use the criteria of, I'm going to choose the model family that has the lowest mean squared error. That won't work. It will, it will eventually start to overfit. Um, it'll start just uh, memorizing this data, and for any point that isn't in the original data, you're going to be completely out of, uh, you know, out of the correct range. Um, and that you could see that uh, you know, if we were to extrapolate this little bit of the curve down at uh, you know, 14 here, if you're of length you know, 12, uh, your weight is like, I don't know, maybe negative 100. Um, it's a data point that wasn't in the original thing. Uh, it didn't have to fit it. We have too many degrees of freedom, and it's allowed to do something that uh, just doesn't generalize well. So mean squared error is not the way to go when you're uh, trying to figure out which is the best model family. Um, so let me see here. Uh, okay, so we want to talk a little bit about uh, the different types of errors that we can make. And this will kind of allow us to uh, figure out what we might be able to do in order to uh, choose the right model family. So there's actually three kind of errors that you can make. Um, I'm just going to write a note that says switch camera. Um, the 
Jeez, my handwriting is terrible some days. Um, These are types of errors. Or maybe types of errors isn't the right uh, term. Contributors to errors. So any error we have is going to be composed of some different, uh, different components. Um, irreducible error, these are things that you're never going to be able to get rid of. Uh, when we look at the fish, uh, we measured a fish that was, we measured three fish that were 40, uh, 43 centimeters, and we got three different readings for the weight of the fish. That's an irreducible error. That's just a, a function of things being, having some variance out in the world. You know, the real value uh, isn't a single one true value for a lot of things. You can't get rid of that. Irreducible error is something that you just, you don't, you can't, don't worry about it, um, you can't get rid of it. Uh, bias is something that is introduced by the model family. Bias is a, uh, a contributor to error where the model family cannot, uh, cannot represent the function you need. So in the case of the fish, uh, when we use a linear model, a straight linear model, we have a bias there. It wouldn't matter how much data we got. Uh, bias is sort of measured that if you had an infinite amount of data and you could choose the very best model with all the data you could ever get, um, you will still uh, have errors. Uh, and that's just because your model can only represent so much. So there's always a bias. Every model family has something where it's constraining the way that it can, uh, it can pr uh, produce predictions. And so you'll always have this bias term. Uh, and again, it's, it's the, uh, the error that, will, that you will get from the model family no matter how much data you, you have. Then the variance... Um, the wrong one there. Um, this is due to limited training data. So variance error is because we're only taking a sample of the distribution. We're only going to get, we're not getting an infinite amount of data to, to uh, regress against. We're only getting a thousand data points and that thousand data points is some sample of the, the complete distribution. Uh, if we get a different sample, uh, we're going to get a different regression. And the variance uh, error component is that, that difference from if we looked at all the possible data sets we could, uh, we could get, we just kept resampling, uh, we'd get some sort of variance that you know, we can't get rid of again. Um, and so our job here is going to be uh, sort of to balance off the trade-off of bias versus variance. Um, and we're going to end up looking at, a, a, and again, we can't get rid of irreducible error, so we're just going to ignore that one. Um, the odd thing is it's actually kind of hard to measure how much is irreducible error versus bias and variance and that sort of thing. Um, but what we're going to end up doing is we can make a graph. And we're going to, we're going to talk about complexity of the model, uh, sorry, of the model family. Um, so as you get, go this way, you have a more complex model, meaning that you, you know, you're going from a linear to a quadratic to a cubic model, um, that sort of thing. Um, on the Y here, we're going to uh, plot some sort of error. And then we're going to look at what contributes to your error. You got two contributors. Okay, you got three contributors, but we're ignoring irreducible. So uh, what we expect to see is the bias error, 
that's a, uh, is going to start, you know, somewhat high. Uh, we're only using a linear model. We can't fit a, you know, something that needs to be quadratic. Um, it's going to start kind of high. Uh, but as you get a more and more complex model, it will go down, you know, maybe not to zero, but it'll keep going lower and lower. Um, the variance uh, goes sort of in the opposite direction. Uh, so when you have a very simple model, changes in your data do, don't really move things around very much. But when you have a very complex model, something that can squiggle through every data point, uh, then changes, small changes in your data set actually produce a lot of change in your prediction in the model that you learn. So what we're going to want to do here is figure out a way to trade off these two things. Um, and if you were to add these two curves together, you're going to get kind of a something like that. And what we want to do is we want to find a sweet spot right here. This is the sweet spot. Not a technical term, I'm guessing. Um, that's sort of the place we want to go. Uh, so we want to find some way to measure that. Um, the, uh, there's a whole, I'm going to actually skip this. There's a whole derivation of uh, how you can look at uh, calculating sort of how the, how the variance and the bias add up into the, uh, the overall error. Um, it's worth looking at. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the book. It's a little bit complicated. We only have, you know, five minutes left. I don't want to uh, get bogged down in all the math here. Uh, it's two pages of math, so uh, I'm going to just move on. It's worth looking at, at, at it in the book. But the real, the real takeaway from it is that error is composed of bias and variance, uh, and it's almost always a trade-off. Um, you can, now it's not, you know, lowering the bias doesn't raise the, vi the variance by the same amount, so you can find a good spot, but there's always this trade-off where more complexity is going to lower the, lower the bias, increase the variance. Uh, is, is there any questions on bias versus variance? This is conceptually a difficult thing, I find. Uh, certainly when I had my first ML course, I had no idea what it was. I couldn't understand it. Um, it wasn't until I kind of had to work through this stuff to really uh, understand it. What was that? What's a bias? What's a bias? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, bias is the, is the error that you will have due to choosing a model family, no matter how much data you have. If you had all the data possible, an infinite amount of data, you will still have an error. And again, if you go back to this fish thing, if we had all of, the, if we had a billion uh, data points along here, it's going to follow this curve somewhat. And the bias for this linear thing says that we can never fit that curve. It doesn't matter how much data we get. We will never fit that curve. Um, and the variance, it, like I said, is uh, due to uh, having a constrained amount of data when we train. And when you change that data set, uh, the variance error is sort of the cost you pay for only having that, that limited data set. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult concept. It's, it's a little bit slippery for some reason. It's a very statistical way of looking at things. Did you have a question or are you just stretching there? Yes. Yeah, uh, so think about, think about this. If I were to, to drop these two data points and get two new ones over here, it would probably make a much different curve right there. Um, so this complexity is high, and it allows it to, it, it makes it so that small changes in the data set are going to make big changes in the result, in the, in the actual prediction. 
Whereas if you're looking over on this guy, um, especially if you're looking at the linear model, uh, you know, the changing these, dropping these two points is probably not going to change that linear model at all. So the variance is really low when you have a very simple model. Um, all the error comes from the fact that the model can't really fit the data well. Uh, and that's, again, the bias uh, that comes from it. Um, they're kind of a separate topic. Uh, you would, you generally want to drop out your outliers first if you can. Um, but the bias versus the variance, uh, it's almost more of a conceptual topic that you have to understand um, than something that you have a practical formula for. Uh, so we talk a lot about bias versus variance, and when you're doing ML, you often will talk about bias versus variance. Uh, you will often say, I wonder if this model can fit my data. Um, can I do, you know, it'll never fit it perfectly, most likely, but is it possible to fit it in a, uh, a useful way? And so you do conceptually talk about bias, um, and so sometimes you will uh, try a more complicated model, but in general, it's not something where there's a formula that says, calculate this bias, calculate this variance, make a trade-off, uh, try a thousand models sort of thing. Uh, now we're going to talk about a really simple technique, um, or at least two simple techniques uh, that will allow you to calculate this stuff, but uh, it's not really, they're limited in, in their usefulness to some extent. Okay, so what do you do about this? That's the question. Um, the first thing is you can use cross-validation. Um, so you can use cross-validation to sort of choose the best, all I did is write cross-validation. Uh, <laughs> cross-validation. Um, and I, I'm going to have to go right back to the other thing. Um, oh, really slow there for a second. Okay, now we're just scrolling. I think it broke. Um, that's okay, I didn't, still didn't go far enough. Uh, so with cross-validation, um, this is actually an example of cross-validation with leave one out error. Um, and you can actually see that uh, you can look at sort of the, uh, uh, let's see, what is this showing? Is this the error? Yeah, the error. Um, so using cross-validation, you can kind of look at how the error is going down. Now, this is, this is not error on the training set, because as we said, error on the training set you can sort of push down arbitrarily by making a more complex model. This is error on a test set. Um, and what you see here is that cross-validation is actually saying that probably um, you know, somewhere right around here, uh, a degree of two is the right size of, or the right amount of complexity. Um, so cross-validation, if you can do it, is actually a good, uh, a good system to use. Now cross-validation, uh, again, can be expensive, depending on how many data points you have, uh, but often it's not, you know, you have to train the model multiple times. It's not too bad, depending on how much data you have. Uh, it's a good, uh, sort of uh, technique. Um, there's one other technique, uh, more of a heuristic that we can use if we can't do cross-validation. We'll talk about that briefly uh, next Tuesday. Um, and unless there's questions, uh, you guys can go. Anything before we go? All right, cool. Uh, I'll see you guys next Tuesday. Hey, what's up? Um, I have a question on this procedure. Somehow, I mean, I did the procedure that seems correct, like padding all the vectors and stuff like that. But when it comes to clustering, like my computer just abandons. 
And I, I posted on, on, for that on Kedza, but I, I try to keep things like uh, agglomerative clustering, like hi hierarchical. You, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't need that. Um, so the whole point of hierarchical clustering, uh, k-means hierarchical clustering, yeah. is you take a fairly small set of data and you very coarsely uh, cluster it. So, so it's like this. So I think we even recommend this. Um, so if you, have, if you have n data points, maybe you take n over, it depends on how much data you have, uh, but let's say you take n over 100 uh, of the data points. You sample 1 in 100. Um, and then you cluster those into, let's say you cluster them into k equals, and we'll say k1 equals 3. So you take your 100 data points, they're wherever, you're going to cluster them into three clusters. Now, I've taken only 1% of the data. These are going to be pretty rough, uh, and I only have three clusters. So, so the, uh, the complexity of this is only k1 times n over 100, as opposed to uh, something much, much higher. Um, now I can come along, and I can take another subset of the data, probably more of the data, and I can take it, and we will do a prediction uh, to find a cluster for each data point. So now we have, uh, for each data point uh, that we are going to use this time, we're going to get a cluster. And so now we split up our data, and there's going to be some in this cluster, and some over in this cluster, and some over in this cluster. Now we do... Uh, we choose a K2, let's say we do 4, uh, and we cluster just the data that fell in here. So now we get 4 guys um, and 4 guys. Uh, but now we have 12 clusters. Um, now the accuracy of those cluster centers might be a little less, but we were able to do it. Um, That's a trade-off I'm yeah, yeah. So, so you should be able to do this. And the whole point is, to form three clusters, you need a lot less data. And to form four clusters, you need a lot less data than you would need if you did 12. Uh, makes sense? Yes. So that should help you with your, with your k-means. I tried to do it with, uh, with sklearn, and they have like an agglomerative clustering. Like yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's so just like gluing like pieces together. Yeah, I don't know that that would work. So I, I should better like yeah, so k me uh, that's actually not any faster because it's still going to have to do a... The problem with agglomerative is that it has to do a pairwise distance between all the points. So it's actually worse than k-beans. It, it, I mean, it's, it's way, you know, it's, it's bad. Um, you, uh, you actually go to n squared each, each time as opposed to n, n to the k. So, uh, so it's actually way worse than k-means. K-means is very fast. Like Comparatively, a, a recommended library for, for such uh, there is a hierarchical k-means library inside of SK Learn. I'm pretty sure. Um, I'll have a look. Yeah, but but it's easy enough to do the k-means twice. Uh, you know, you actually end up doing with you know with k of three and k of four, you would end up doing clustering yeah. four yeah. times because you'd have the first one to be three and then one for each of those. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. No problem. Yeah. So why should we use? Why? Yeah. Just in general? Um, it's just a trade-off of uh, efficiency versus how long it takes to cluster versus uh, uh, how, much, how much time you have. If you have infinite compute, you just don't do hierarchical cl clustering. You just do, you know, 12 clusters. But if you are limited in computing power, you can do a much smaller percentage of the data for the first level of clustering, and then maybe an, a small amount of data for the second level of clustering, and you can end up using a lot less compute to get the same number of clusters. So the hierarchical clustering is to improve the efficiency? Yeah. yeah, it's to improve the efficiency. You'll probably get worse clusters um, because, you know, there might be a data point that was way over at the edge that is maybe it should have been in this cluster, but it gets for I mean, this is a bad, because these clusters are so far apart, but, you know, it gets forced to be in this cluster 
when maybe if we clustered it without hierarchy, it would have been pushed, you know, this cluster center would have moved this way a little bit, this point would have got over here. So it's, it's not done for accuracy, it's definitely done for, uh, for efficiency. With doing was sixty percent accuracy on the final classification. Um, I mean, there's there's the question of how well is the clustering doing, and then there's a separate quest question of how well is the uh, uh, classifier doing. And I don't know what you should look on Piazza to see what people are getting or ask and see if you're in the ballpark. 60% uh, sounds low, but, but remember you're doing uh, multiple classes, so you know, maybe, uh, you just have to ask other people. I haven't done this, this particular homework to get the exact numbers, uh, but uh, the TAs have, so they kind of have a, you know, an idea. Now there are parameters you can play with, like how many clusters you use, how big the, uh, the chunks are, and then obviously you could have a mistake in there. Um, you, did you normalize your feature vectors after you? Uh, so you do the you do the histogram. Um, you should normalize those to be uh, because long, long, uh, long data points will get more uh, more clusters in them, and so you have to normalize out so that they all add up to the same amount of clusters. So a long, you know, if, you're, if your input signal is this long, maybe you get 10 clusters out of it. Uh, if your input signal is this long, maybe you get two clusters out of it. So if you have 10 clusters, you'd have to divide by 10 for this guy. If you have two, you'd divide by two. Um, and then the feature vectors are all sort of on the same scale. And if you don't do that, then it has to learn. It, it's a lot harder for it to learn. So you may have skipped that step. Yeah, that's that's a pretty common one to miss. Yep, no problem. What's up? Question about regularization. Yep. So it's to make the linear regression stable. Yeah. It sort of stabilizes that linear regression. And it's because uh, taking the inverse the covariant matrix like exponentially increases the size of the eigenvalues, which means there's more correlation. Uh, well, it the uh, this. This guy will, sorry, this guy will have very small eigenvalues. Yeah. Um, which means that this guy will have very big eigenvalues. Okay. Which means that if you take anything times something with big eigenvalues, mm -hmm. you get a big change. So okay. if you were to change a data point in here, uh -huh. it will be a different, different value on this side. You will amplify it with the big eigenvalues, so you'll get a big change in beta. Okay. So beta is essentially very unstable because we add or remove a data point and all of a sudden beta, and remember beta, you know, tilts the, uh, is like the tilt of the, of the regression. So yeah. if you change beta a lot, you're suddenly, you know, shifting the, that plane. Uh, I mean, it's a hyperplane. Uh, we always draw it as a, in a graph as yeah. one dimensional, but, um, but it's really a hyperplane that you're going to shift a whole bunch by, by having that uh, big change. So regression takes this, this thing with very uh, small eigenvalues adds in something that's basically stabilizing it, meaning that the eigenvalues all have to be some minimum size. Um, because they're a minimum size, when you take the inverse, they don't get really huge. Because they don't really get really huge, it stabilizes this whole choice. And then this lambda is for the stabilization is determined by uh, cross-validation. Yeah, and if the lambda goes too high, basically the lambda will overwhelm this this matrix, and it'll just become basically an identity matrix. I mean, if you took this arbitrarily high, you know, all the all the values are going to become lambda for the eigenvalues. Um, actually, that may not be true, but uh, they all become something that where this x transpose x doesn't have any influence because they're so big. Yeah, you want you want the data to have some influence. You want the lambda to constrain it so that it's stable. Um, and then you choose it through cross-validation, you know, that's the easiest way to, to choose it. Okay, so why did you add this to the square error? That, that is, 
that is the regularization um, wow. that you add. And then you take the derivative to do the minimization. This is the derivative. This is this, basically, after you've taken the derivative and moved a bunch of things around. You take the derivative, you set it equal to zero, you move a bunch of things around, and you come out with that. Wait, so, so we're taking the derivative of the squared error, right? The squared error plus the, the plus regularization term. But why so are we the, adding the regularization term here? Like, doesn't that mean we're increasing our error, or no? Uh, you definitely are, this is the loss function, so you definitely are increasing that loss function, yeah. but you don't really care. That loss function is just sort of, the thing that you're going to minimize. Okay. You don't care about the absolute value of the loss just as, mu as much as you care about the minimum of it. Oh. So you just need to use it as, it's just to guide you to the right spot. It's not like, because otherwise we could just take a loss function of zero. I could just say my loss function, the loss function, you get to choose that. Um, so you could choose a, lo a loss function of zero and you, you'd have nothing. You know, it wouldn't do anything correctly. So